Alright, I'm still using my new recorder and I'm not used to it. So hopefully this is recording, we'll find out. Uh, that's supposed to be the recorder marker. Yeah, it seems to be working. Uh, we're back again in Revelation 17 and we had stopped at uh, 8B with the end of our anaphoric center which remember, see that's what these highlights are, 6 through 8 which you determine in a purely mechanical process and I knew that, I learned that from uh, 7 years ago when I did Ephesians 1 and it turns out the whole New Testament, all the prophetical passages in the New Testament follow the same procedure so we're following it here I've done prior videos already on how Matthew does it uh, Matthew 24, 25 and then after that Ephesians 1 comes because that shows me where Ephesians got it from and then after that published in the same year was uh, Luke's gospel in chapter 21 of that gospel is parallel passage to Matthew 24 25 and then Mark 13 does it too and Mark is um, doing the prophecy for the Byzantine Empire and it turns out I didn't know this at the time I started those videos it turns out that the Byzantines consider Mark to be their apostle okay so Mark is playing on Ephesians and Luke prior and on Matthew 24-25 prior when he builds his timeline and he's the guy who started that I noticed he's the guy who started this business of truncating Kai to Kaiser, Kaiser to Kai and now we're seeing Revelation playing on Mark 13 do the same thing alright so there's a consistency here that means it's deliberate it's not brain out it's not um, what do you want to call it a coincidence it's a coincidence when it happens twice alright it's deliberate when it happens over and over again okay and the other thing that Mark does that um, actually is done also in Matthew and in Luke but mostly in Matthew because Luke kind of avoids the, the anaphoric keywords this I don't it means I saw alright it's the Greek verb in the vocabulary form is horao and it means I see alright and this is traced all these blue highlights is the tracing of the use of the word and just like all these other anaphoric keywords like harlot and um, beast the distance between each one of these blues in syllable counts is divisible by seven so just like I was saying before the syllable count for each occurrence of woman or whore the distance between the first and the second the second and the third la 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 or the distance between beast one occurrence beast two occurrence beast three occurrence and so forth they're each divisible by seven in the syllable counts that tells you again it's deliberate it also tells you that we've got the same text that the writer wrote so all these people busy telling you the Bible is corrupted and all the stupid King James only people who say that that God couldn't get it right until 1611 well they're proved foolish and wrong and liars but what you prove better is that yeah these are the real words that John wrote everything's timed the prophecies are all timed they, the same thing is true in the Old Testament we just haven't gone through all the prophecies yet but there are fewer prophetic passages in the New Testament but every time you find them they're, they're timed in the same way that Moses did it starting in Genesis 1 all the prophetical passages in the Old Testament are timed. Alright, it's just a question of, you know, doing the grunt work of parsing out by clause or verse and counting up the syllables. You don't have to be a doctor or a Bible scholar to do that. You have to know a few things about syllable counts. You know, what constitutes a syllable? Well, see, here's a consonant, another consonant, and a, and a vowel. Cree. That's one syllable. It's true in pretty much any language. Ma. That's pretty much true in any language. In fact, in Mandarin Chinese, you got four different words that come out of that one word. That's one sound in English, but it's got four different tones. Ma means mother. 
Ma means curse. Same sound. Okay? Or no, I think it's ma. I think ma means horse. I forget. I, I took Mandarin Chinese 40 years ago, so my brain is out. The point is that when we get here to verses 6 and 8, we have, as it were, a tradition of rhetorical style that is being followed by the writer of other Bible books that he's aping to other Bible books to show you how to read those other Bible books. That's why I keep harping on saying this is quantum Bible because this is a quanta, a word, metus, metu, metusan. Drunk, so you can see, you can hear it. Do yeah, that's what you start doing. You start slurring your words, and you can't quite make the next syllable count. All right. So this is a, this is a style you can document and prove yourself. It's objective in that sense. Where it becomes subjective is like, okay, now you know that the syllable counts are this. What what is what history does this tie to? So obviously you're going to want to verify, talk to God and verify. Well, Brain is saying it's this count, you can easily verify that much. But then she's saying, well, oh, it's it's this it's this timeline. Well, is that right or wrong? And it, it, usually, if it's wrong, it means that there's something else. Okay. Because you can't ever get all the meaning, you can't ever state all the meaning out of even one phrase of the Bible. So I know that some of what I'm telling you is not going to be true, in, at least in the sense that it's not enough. But I have to start somewhere because nobody knows this but me right now. So what I'm trying to show you, here's the anaphoric center from 6 through 8. How you got there, we covered at the beginning of the Quantum Bible series. All right. And now we're coming to the end of verse 8, starting with this guy who I didn't talk about rightly in the past two increments, Anastasius. All right. And here's Odovacher. He, I thought in one of my prior increments I said, oh, he died here. No, he actually dies here. You know what that means in Greek? Not. Factual not. Does not exist. So at that very word in Greek, Odovacher no longer exists. And starting here, oh crud. Well, that's Odovacher. So you see, they say Odoacer. All right. He no longer exists. So, but Anastasius, which the name, this is what's so clever about scripture. This is how you know that it's prophecy, and also how you can figure out you got it right in your interpretation. Anastasius. Anastasis means born again. It also has a connotation of resurrection. Okay, it's got both meanings. Okay, more, more resurrection. But born again would be the same idea when you stop to think about it. Alright? So resurrection. A resurrection. See... You get in at a 490, this is God's basic time grant, 490, and it started as I showed in the prior increment, not as well as I'd like, in uh, episode 7b, I showed how the 490 repeats itself in history, and I did a whole bunch of videos showing the math of that, and you can verify it directly in Bible, and you can verify it directly in history too, once you see how, how it works. But what we're finding out here now is specifically what happens in history as a 490 ends. And it's not just one 490. It's four of them. Here, 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 and here. So he's counting six because he's taking into account the voting period. One, two, three. That's why I highlighted them yellow. Four, five, five, I'm sorry. He's taking into account the voting period. All right. Start of a new 490 after the voting period is the fifth one. All right. The first one, he's plotting it out based like Paul did. And this has been bothering me now for about, I don't know, seven years. Um, Paul tags the 490 from Christ's birth 
in Ephesians 1 when he does his timeline, his prophetic timeline, which to, you know, to you in translation looks like a mere doxology, but it's not. It's a prophetical timeline. And he stops it at 490 because he's basically saying, and I knew this at the time, He's basically saying, hi, it's wash, rinse, repeat. He's giving you a paradigmal outline of history. That's why it's phrased as a doxology, because it will just keep on recurring as a trend of history. All right, that's why he wrote it that way. And I knew that at the time, but I didn't understand what I know now, because of what John is writing here, playing on Paul. Playing on Paul. See, because John is the guy who's anal about reconciling all the timelines. Of course, he's the last writer of the Bible. I guess that should be his job. So he's saying here, hi, your first 1090. Think of them as a series of 1090, like a, a mini-series in four parts. And they're each 30 years long. Well, not quite. Let's go through it. The first 490 ends at 490 AD. That's 490 from Christ's birth. And we have to call it that. It's really, he was really born 4 B.C., at the end of 4 B.C., but that's due to an error. We have to say it that way because there's an error by a guy named Varro who was alive at the time Christ was born, and Augustus liked the way he said how old Rome was, but Varro was wrong by three years. Livy was right in saying that Rome was only 750 years old at the time. So if you use the Livy calendar, you'd be calling this 33 AD when Christ died instead of 30. But you can't really do that and reconcile to the past AD, and you can't reconcile the Bible. So we just have to live with the, the end of 4 BC birthday. And that's what they're doing here. That's what John is doing here. That's what all the writers do. They say, okay, fine, it's all screwed up because of our own. We're just going to treat the last 30 years as Christ's birth, because that's essentially what you have to do to reconcile the Varro. In those days, when Paul was alive, when Christ was alive, that's what they all had to do. So this is their Anno Domini accounting, but they're doing it in more than one way. The second is that they're going to reconcile based on Christ's death. Because he dies in 30 AD. Okay, what's 490 after that? It's 420. 520, rather. And I showed you that at the end of 7b in poor fashion because I couldn't get the video to line up with the audio. Okay, so Justin, Justin the first is still alive when that 520 ends. And just as, as John was doing here, he's mixing the end of the 490 with the end of the actual ruler. Okay, Zeno ends in 491, so he just concatenates it. He makes the phrase end with the ruler. All right, well, he's doing the same thing here. Justin, well, I'm not going to get to in this increment. I'll get to him later. Justin dies at the end of 526, and that's really, they, they call it 527. That's really here. Here's another Kai. The whole Kai pun is being done again. But the end of his effective rule ends at the end of this clause. So he effectively was. He was like 70 years old when he comes to the throne in the first place. And his, his uh, nephew, who's Justinian, who's going to be the real bad boy of this clause, of this passage. His nephew Justinian is actually ruling in his place. So he's concat John is concatenating the effective end of Justin I with the 520 that's the end of the 490 based on Christ's death. You get that? Okay. I'm sorry this is so complicated, but it, hopefully it helps you appreciate how precise scripture is. So, we aren't really there yet, but we are at the part between the two. We are at the 30-year, um, you know, it's, it's depicted as 35, which is kind of interesting. It's depict, it, we're at the period between the two with Anastasius. All right, and that's what I'm going to pick up in the next increment because I don't know how this recorder is going to play.